on? Can you hear me? Okay. Great. Thank you so much for that introduction. And thanks for having me here, and thanks all of you for showing up. I didn't even know if I was going to get here. I was, uh, I lived north of Spokane and, and uh, a couple of hours, and it, it snowed so steadily for two days. And I thought, okay, this isn't going to work. I'm never going to get to Missoula, because I had to go to, to Cheney, Washington, to the Eastern, Eastern Washington University, and do a keynote speech at lunch today for another conference. And so I hit the road, and then it was like, oh my god, I'm in Pacific time. I'm going to mountain time. That is not working in my favor. And, but fortunately, the roads were great. So if you were anticipating travel on major travel routes, East, west, you're cool. Nowhere else. Just those, this that route. So, anyhow, thank you again. I'm going to get my gizmos going. And All right. I have my entire speech written out and on PowerPoint, so you can read along with me as I read it to you. Not. Not doing that at all. No. I hate that when that happens. All right. Um, yes, thank you for inviting me to join this celebration of the 50th anniversary of the Wilderness Act. And I would like to dedicate this talk tonight to two people who are no longer with us. One well, very well known, that's Walkin' Jim Stoltz. Folks know Walkin' Jim? You bet. And well, afterwards, we'll, uh, we'll have a little video clip going. We're, we're going to put that in the front, but it didn't work. Um, so we'll, we'll get to hear some of his music and... and uh, if you don't know him, you need to get to know him. His work as a, an author, a writer, a troubadour, a songwriter, a musician, uh, an educator, skier, adventurer, and wilderness walker. 28,000 miles that man has walked and touched probably 10 times that many people's hearts. Sadly, he died in, in 2010. The other person I'd like to dedicate this to is a friend of mine who um, passed away about a month ago, and you probably don't know him. 
His name was Phil Taylor. He was an accountant, worked down and lived in the Bitterroot. And Phil, for all his mild-mannered mild accountant appearance, was uh, a very staunch advocate for wilderness conservation, and I would say almost radical in his, uh, in his efforts. First time I met Phil, he came to Nevada when I was having a, a little, uh, what do I call it, a tete-a-tete -tete with some anti-federal government folks. And uh, he showed up with his, his video camera, and he said, you know what? Let's get the bastards on film, and then we can figure out what they're up to. And they're not going to get crazy if I have a camera in their face. Well, they did anyhow, but not bad, cra like violent crazy. Which, and you know, Phil showed up many a time to cover my back and, and to coach me, mentor me, urge me to, to uh, fight harder, fight longer. And uh, I'm going to miss him a lot. But uh, you know, there are heroes among us that we know well, and then there are a lot of heroes that we don't know who are also helping us maintain this wonderful legacy of wilderness. I'll figure out my little gizmo here. All you can see mostly is pretty pictures. Every once in a while I'll put another one up. It may or may not be relevant to what I'm saying, but you'll like it. <laughs> You know, one of the things that I really like about the Wilderness Act, and especially as a, as a former Fed, we've never made an acronym out of the Wilderness Act. It's not the WA. You know, everything else has an, a an acronym. And, uh, and I was so delighted when I sat and thought, you know, we've never abbreviated it. And it should never be abbreviated. It was, is, and always should be the Wilderness Act. The significance of the Wilderness Act can't be understated. And the significance of the wilderness that it's protecting, economically, ecologically, and culturally. You know, we look back at, the, uh, at when the wilderness movement really started. It's not like the act just kind of you know, appeared when people got interested in wilderness. It actually started back in about 1866, something like that, with, uh, with Thoreau. And from Thoreau, he passed the baton on to Muir, on to Leopold, Marshall, Carhartt, and the latter of those were instrumental in getting the Forest Service to designate, by administrative designation, just out of the goodness of their hearts, more or less, nine million acres of wilderness. That sort of held on to a nice starting piece that was re ready, willing, and able to jump into official wilderness in 1964. After those fellows, um, and I believe there were probably women, but they never quite make it into the history book, except for Maudie Murray, um, her and her husband, um, uh, Aldous? Of oh, oh, so, thank you. Um, and Ed Zonheiser were actually extremely instrumental in picking up the pen and starting to draft the first uh, draft of the Wilderness Bill, the Wilderness Act. However, it took them about 60 iterations in eight years to get that thing signed. So there was actually a great buildup of momentum behind them and through that process. The idea of wilderness as we know it today is a social construct, but it's also a social contract for current generations and for future generations. You know, they, these, um, the originators of the, the Wilderness Act really hit on a winning formula because not, alway, not always do these efforts succeed, unfortunately. But in this case, the right uh, individuals, the right politicians, the right timing, the right public support all came together. And with persistence and luck and timing, we got it passed. But inevitably, behind all that work and all the, all the politicking that takes place was their desire, their commitment, their intention, and the heart that they put into getting this particular bill passed. And there is a lot of heart in the Wilderness Act. And it's heart that's there not because people are pushing it because they think that they're going to gain materially from it, but rather that they're doing it from a very altruistic position. Altruism is the love of people, the love of others around you, and the willingness to extend generosity to them without personal gain. But there was also that element of biophilia, the love of nature, the love of all living things. And so with that combination, 
these people were absolutely mandated personally to proceed with this, to protect these landscapes because it would be self-treason if they were not to act on, on the, those feelings. You know, we, I really believe that we humans are wired to love nature. And, whoops, oh, that was, yeah, oh, that was something else I was going to talk about. But we've already covered that. So we'll just, we'll just press on. Um, that was the mention of the, the human dimension. Actually, let me talk about that for a second. Um, when the Forest Service first started to, to address ecosystem management, or what they called ecosystem-based management, in 1992, they developed six principles. All six principles were ecological principles. There was not one that addressed humans. Humans are an integral part of landscapes, and you can't make decisions about landscapes without including the human dimension. So I was fortunate enough to be on a team that developed the human dimension. And, uh, and now it is supposed to be supposed to be, you can ask Tom Tidwell about this, equally as important as the biological and the physical dimensions in all Forest Service decisions. So, I do believe that humans are hardwired to love nature. But, how come then we have people who don't seem to love nature, or particularly don't love wilderness, um, don't love it to the point where they're quite agitated about it. And I started to think, well, you know, the words for nature lover, you know, there isn't really a word for, that covers nature lover. The, you look it up in a, in a thesaurus and it's tree hugger, greenie, enviro. It's like, well, that seems almost slanderous. But then I started to think about the opposite. It's like, oh, if you're not a tree hugger, are you a tree choker? If you are not a greenie, are you a blackie or a brownie? Um, and then if you are very much in support of biophilia, the opposite of that would be necrophilia. And I thought, oh, I'm getting way off track here, so we are not going to call anybody a necrophiliac in this particular presentation. So. The Wilderness Act happened just in time. Uh, by the way, I was up until 3 o'clock in the morning last night, so I'm a little, a little crazy. That's OK. Bear with me. It, this is all going to make sense eventually. The Wilderness Act was passed just in time. And I say just in time because post-World War II, we suddenly had money, we had technology, we had enthusiasm, we just won. We're the big guys. And we were going whole hog on resource exploitation. So by 64, we were already getting the pattern down of how we were going to turn all of these um, standing things we called trees into something more valuable, like timber and houses and sawdust and you name it. And then, even more so, once we got really sophisticated and got into the heyday of resource exploitation, use. Uh, I, I don't want to be pejorative because there were really great benefits that came from our use of resources. But at the same time, we kind of went over the top. And that was in the 70s. So fortunately, we had the Wilderness Act in place and were designating wilderness at a very uh, nice clip, I might add. And so we got some protections of some very important landscapes in place. You know, and then I started to think about, well, why, why, do, why does it seem like we're not designating as much wilderness? And so I actually went back and, and did some, some uh, statistics and data analysis. And what I found is that we started off in the decade from 64 to 73. It was a real buildup, and we had quite a bit in this decade here, and then we, were, we hit the 80s and kind of dropped off, and then 90s, and the, then the, the uh, aughts. And suddenly, we're down here to about 3.5 million acres that were designated between um, 1993, 1994 and 2003. Or no, excuse me, the one from 2003 to, to uh, 2014. So. That's not a good curve. I don't like that curve. And I was trying to think of what other curves I could lay on top of that that would help me make sense of why 
we have less and less wilderness designated. It's not like we've just run out of cool places. There's millions and millions of acres that are worthy of wilderness designation. We know the roadless area conservation or the roadless area uh, review and evaluation process, rare one and rare two, we still have about 58 million acres that, that are roadless and many of them of wilderness quality. So what is going on here? So it doesn't seem to match politically with Democrat, Republican, doesn't seem to, to make a difference. Um, there might be a little bit of economics uh, involved there. Um, that, that would be arguable, but but I think you could say that it, was, it might be close. Um, we certainly have an increased need to protect ecosystems, given, that, given the perturbations that we have with climate change, the effects of, of, of too many chemicals in the atmosphere and on our landscapes and in our food. You know, there's, there's really a need, especially in the water air arena, to have landscapes that can resiliently continue to provide the things that we need and provide that habitat that species are going to need as their habitats are, are challenged, um, perhaps beyond the point of them being able to remain in them by these other perturbations. So there's this resistance, and it almost feels like an increased resistance, and particularly coming from politicians. So what's up with that? Well. I thought about it and thought maybe it's the, the technology and this blind consumerism has just sort of insulated us from our recognition of our connection with landscapes. Maybe it's this, uh, you know, in, con in, compressed, um, in, in constrained economic times, we find that we need to have, um, or we take a more utilitarian view of everything. We can't afford the, the uh, soft feelings towards anything because we need to produce and make money. Um, or maybe it's this, this, this rise that it, where it's popular to just deny science. If it doesn't align with your values or your beliefs, eh, doesn't happen. So all this seems to add up to make those people who are consider themselves in the biophilia camp as, as being wrongheaded, um, that they're, they're irrational almost in this, this love of nature. So. These socioeconomic pressures, though, I started to think about that a lot. And it occurred to me that what we've been facing in this very time frame here is a giant sucking sound as the wealth in lower income, well, not, I shouldn't even say lower income, the, the middle class, the upper middle class, the, the, the poor, a lot of our money is getting sucked up to the upper 10%. There could be something to that, because how come politicians with their, their wealthy friends and the big corporations, wilderness doesn't really hurt them. It doesn't slow their profits. It doesn't really change the game. So why are they so against it? Well, let's take a look here. Oh, I have to skip some pretty pictures here. But this is what I want to talk about. There's a study in Harvard that, that a fellow did, um, I believe his name was Mike Norton. He asked 5,000 people, okay, what would you think is the ideal distribution of wealth in the United States? And we'll look at, uh, divide the population into 20% segments. So you've got five segments across there. So what's the ideal distribution? 92% of people said that this looked like a really nice bar graph. You know, the other rich have more, but you know, Nobody is really, you know, super duper hurting. And then he also asked them as a second question, what do you think is the real distribution of wealth? And people said, well, obviously the rich are a little richer than we think they are or ought to be. But uh, yeah, we think it kind of looks like this. Well, this, ladies and gentlemen, is what it really looks like. The top 20% have this large of a percentage of the wealth so large that you'd have to take the, you need a magnifying glass to see the bottom 60%. That's a problem. Why is it a problem? Is it related to wilderness? Well, here's a theory. Wilderness supporters, I would say, kind of fall in this range. I'll do it down here to show you to, because I, I can cover more. 
sort of the concentration in this zone. And, and these are gross generalizations. I realize that there are wilderness lovers and supporters across the entire spectrum. But, but bear with me. Gross generalization. Middle class, upper middle class, very strong supporters of, of, um, of wilderness. Now, some of these folks up here, it behooves them to excite some of the people on this end of the spectrum and say, the reason that you're not moving up the spectrum is because you've got a block in the middle. You've got some people here who don't really care whether you have a job. And you know that you can't ha take care of the environment and still have a job. job. Environmental regulations prohibits jobs. Well, we know that's a, a grand mythology and, and, and morally bereft. But maybe that's what's working here. Maybe some of these folks who are really ne needing a job, really needing income, are ready to buy into anything. And they don't want a complicated theory about trade agreements and, and emerging markets crashing and moving, uh, you know, causing, causing a, a defaults and a reduction in the, the uh, value of certain currency. Blah, blah, blah. That's too complicated. Point to who's doing this to me. And so I posit that we've got some folks up in this end of the bar who are telling people at this end of the bar, it's these people in the middle who are doing bad things to you. Maybe true, maybe not. But for now, I'll believe it. So this is what little dollars actually look like. When you graph out that top bar, here's the, 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 the line that shows what people think is ideal. Here's what people think is, or excuse me, here's what people think is ideal. This line is the reality, or what they think is the reality. And this is the real reality. When we get up into the 90%, we have to take the top off this bar and put it over here because the 90%, the, the upper uh, 90 to 99% have way more than fits on the chart. And here is Mr. and Mrs. 1%. They almost need their own screen for all, that they, all the money that they hold and control. And where did that come from? Much of it came from over here, the giant sucking sound. So I am not being a conspiracy theorist. I'm not an occupier wannabe. I'm a realist. And when I see stuff like this, and I can't figure out what's happening, why we can't get wilderness at a time when we so desperately need to protect our productive surfaces on the planet Earth. What is going on? That's my working theory. Now I, we can relax a little bit. Not much, but a little bit. So this, uh, I think I'm just in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but I had some more thoughts about that. But, you know, this, this idea that we can hang on to mythologies, and if we just repeat them loud enough with, and often enough with the right messengers, they remain a part of our culture. Environment versus jobs. Tobacco doesn't make you sick. Um, climate change isn't even happening, let alone being caused by humans. You know, next it's going to be, well, gravity's not really happening. It's, it's my faith that keeps me standing upright. So anyhow, this messaging, this riling up of, of certain groups, I think is a guise to take away our attention from the shift in wealth and from all the other dastardly things that are going on, particularly in the arena of fossil fuel energy development, that is really compromising our future. So, we find that this designating wilderness is viewed by some as being absolutely opposite of manifest destiny, American exceptionalism, our rugged individualism, the minimum government intrusion, which was intended by our founders, and that it's counter to, as Dick Cheney would call it, our non-negotiable lifestyles. Well, maybe Dick was talking about negotiating with some people that he could control, but who we're really, or who and what we're really negotiating with is nature and future generations. I really do believe that people truly love and have a strong connection to the natural world. 
And I believe that because when we look back at the, the length of time that humans have been on the planet, and that is a real tricky question because what species of humans are forerunners and all this. Anyhow, most people settle in at about 400,000 years. Creatures that, that were pretty much like us were around. So, for 400,000 years, not only species like us, but all the other species were completely dependent on the natural world to provide everything that they needed. Now, they developed over time. They, they learned to meet all of their needs, transportation, you name it, by technologies that they refined over thousands of years, trial and error, testing, communicating, sharing. They developed a, a body of knowledge of place-based skills, knowledge, and abilities. They also developed social and economic structures that were a reflection of their, the place where they live. And it helped them not only to survive in that place, but to thrive. Who wants to just work really hard and barely survive? We have an imperative to have fun, to enjoy ourselves, to thrive for abundance. And that was possible if you really knew your landscape. We're obviously still really dependent on these, um, on the natural world, but we've become very much generalists, especially as related to place. And we've, per we've developed a system where we can just trade dollars for necessities, where we don't have to actually know anything. I do this at a lot, if you've ever been to another talk of mine, I probably have done this to you, I'm going to do it again. And, um, but that is, how many of us, how many of you know exactly and precisely where your water comes from? I do. If you have a well, you can usually zone in on that. Do you know exactly and precisely where your wastewater goes when you're done with it? And away is not the answer. <laughs> okay. How many know where your medicines come from exactly and precisely? Where your food comes from? Some of us gardeners, we know some of where it comes, but all, you know. And I, I do believe there are people that know where just about all of their food comes from, which is laudable and wonderful, and I want them to share that knowledge with everybody else. But our clothing, our building materials, our, our, our energy, our electricity, you know, where's it coming from? We don't know. And, you know, 200 years ago, if we answered, I don't know, we would die. So how could it be that in, in the, over the course of 399,700 years, we forgot all of that knowledge that was accumulated during that period? 200 years, we forgot that all. I mean, I'm generalizing again, but it's a little strange. So I'm thinking it can't be that far gone. We can't have gotten so far away that we can't somehow bring that back. Now, besides the physical uh, benefits and, and necessities that I just itemized, there's also some, something else, another layer, more of that heartbeat of wilderness. And that is our intellect, our, our curiosity being stimulated, our creativity being stimulated by the place where we live, our ability to, to seek out and gain knowledge and to gain inspiration. So adventure, curiosity, intellectual stimulation, um, and then sharing that with our tribe. We bond with others when we share a similar knowledge base or develop that knowledge base together. It's also not only sideways connections, but it's intergenerational cohesion when we share knowledge from one generation to the next. So whether people and cultures have found themselves in a location by choice or by necessity, they began a, a, a systemized methodology to collect information, to catalog environmental and spiritual or environmental knowledge spatially and temporally, what happens through the seasons, when things bloom, when animals are where. All that was really critical information, where the good water was. They learned how to interact protect and exploit the advantages of their particular location. This created a body of profound place-based knowledge that had extremely high value, not only in determining life and death, but also in determining the level of abundance and joy and thriving that, that, a, that a culture would, would um, benefit from in their environment. Even language is shaped 
by, by your environment. So a modern analogy to that, think about when you go to a completely different place, completely different ecosystem. It's kind of unsettling, it's almost jarring. You don't really know what's going on. Besides the social structure, you don't know the landscape. You don't really quite know how to navigate. People say, oh, you know, go up over, uh, you know, Haymaker Ridge and down this. And it's like, whoa, where's that? You know, well, everybody knows where that. Well, you don't. And so it's, it's really kind of unsettling. But, you know, for instance, if you go to a new wilderness that you've not been in before, what do you do? You go to find that body of profound place-based knowledge. This time we go, we buy books, we buy maps, but we also talk to locals. And we figure out how to negotiate and navigate in these new environments because they are new to us. So, some of the other benefits. One of the things that we get from wilderness is joy. Ah, oh, yes. We create conditions conducive to life. We get joy from wilderness because, and wild country, because we express ourselves many times through song and, and through um, stories. And so we, we and early civilizations as well were, are inspired by wild country. We create songs and stories about this country and the, the landscapes that we love. But long ago, these weren't just idle fantasies or making things up and, and this sounds good and that has a catchy beat. Um, these were actually part of history. It's how history was conveyed. It was a collective cultural memory. The stories talked about the ancestors and, and the, the journeys. The journeys, oh, it was the location, verbal maps. The songs actually were, uh, in, the verbal maps were embedded into songs and stories. Early um, civilizations that traveled uh, along the ocean, along the, uh, particularly along the Alaska coast, yes, they used stars and other methods of navigation, but if it's broad daylight, how are you going to know where you're at? They sang songs at a certain cadence, certain number of verses, and by a certain verse you knew where you would be. Amazing. And so we were organizing natural data and, and our spiritual relationship with the land within these songs and stories. The ceremonies that, that were held, the ceremonies that relate directly to key stages of life or key stages in the, in the passage of a year. And it was deemed to be very important to remain in right relationship with those passages of time and with the with the environment. Oh. Sorry about that. So, this right relationship, this is really pretty important. Actually, very important. When people's physical needs are, are, let me, not when, but People's physical needs are intertwined with their spiritual needs. And we can really see that in older civilizations. In times of plenty, there were songs and celebrations of gratitude. In times of, of uh, scarcity, there was supplicant and prayers and ceremonies to try to regain a right relationship with nature and the gods that they assumed were, were controlling that. And they felt they had a responsibility to, to cooperate with nature because that meeting that responsibility would bring them some degree of abundance. From this right relationship also stems social mores, behavior, behavioral codes, and that's reinforced by consequences. And sometimes these were natural consequences. If you offended nature in some way, overuse, abuse, ignoring, disrespecting, there were consequences. And these were often life or death consequences. And you actually were inviting disaster, not just to yourself, but to your whole community, to your tribe. And as a result, it was very likely you could suffer social disgrace. You do something bad enough and you might be shunned. You would be sent to a new location where you don't know or understand what's going on. And you would probably suffer severely for, as a result of that. So 
cultures for millennia have, have realized that you have a responsibility to cooperate with the natural world, and it is a community imperative, not just an individual imperative. And out of that larger community and this right relationship, this reciprocal relationship, developed the concept of homeland, my place. I have, you know, we feel responsible for our own home and family. Well, translate that to landscapes. Communities, cultures feel responsible to maintain and protect their landscapes, their homeland. They would fight and die to protect and defend their homeland. Now that is one thing that we have carried forward. That uh, when with the uh, defense of homeland and defense of religion, people still take up arms and will fight. When we think about our soul's calling, you know, you might want to call it religion or spirituality, uh, we find that, that today, thankfully, we see a lot of religious practices, of religious um, or types of religions are really looking back at their responsibility for caring for creation, as they call it, for stewardship. This is very exciting because it can be used, religion can be used just in the opposite way in that, no, you, have, you don't need to care for creation. You have dominance over it. Use it, abuse it, take it, and then, you know, leave. Um, and what I'm finding is that, that I'm seeing more comments. In public comments, there's more talk about the spiritual importance of landscapes than I've seen in a long time. That's pretty exciting because a spiritual connection to the landscape, acknowledging the spiritual connection to the landscape, can really help us protect those landscapes. And I think what I'd like to do is sort of link this, this awakening, this, um, this feeling of more confidence in speaking out from a spiritual perspective, is maybe our genetic memory is waking up. Maybe all those hundreds of thousands of years that we were collecting information and interacting with our landscape, maybe we're starting to remember that because our landscapes are in more peril now. So, With this genetic memory or our reptilian brain, uh, our basal ganglia, whatever you want to call it, that's our, the location of our instincts, our, our survival mechanisms, our, our territorialism. And what I'm finding or what I'd like to believe is that most of us actually have a predilection towards a certain landscape. And think about that. Do you have a, a place where you've, you've either known about or you've experienced for a long time or you just arrived and suddenly it's like, oh, I love this place. You know, I really feel this connection to this place. Um, I feel a pull uh, towards a certain geography. You know, I just like it. I want to be there. I, I want to have a career that allows me to be there. I want to recreate in those places. I want to have a partner who enjoys those places with me. I want to retire in those places. This deep connection is really difficult to explain with, through any rational um, description and any rational criteria. It's just we just have a feeling that, that we love the place and want to be there. And, but the sad thing is that as the level of development increases, it blurs the lines of those places that we're attracted to. I spoke to a young man today and he was telling me he was from Williston, North Dakota. He was crying. Williston, North Dakota isn't anything like the Williston, North Dakota that he knew. His family's lost their ranch. They've been severed from their connection to the land and everything else that's happening on top of that, the development from the, uh, the, sh um, the shale gas is, is, has changed everything and cut his relationship with place. You know, it's kind of like picking up a book and trying to read a book that has 100 people who have made margin notes in it underlined, highlighted, whatever, it's, not, it's barely recognizable. Whereas wilderness gives us a blank book in our favorite color with creamy pages that either have wonderful poetry and prose on it or blank pages that we can fill in. That's the difference. So, 
So what the, I'm really talking about is sense of place, that intrinsic connection to landscapes that we love. And sense of place can be defined. It's a personal, holistic interpretation of a place. It includes aesthetics, symbolism, symbols, values, cultural activities, history, um, the animals and plants that inhabit it, the seasons. But it's also part of that is that all that is also strengthened by events that happen there that we either know about and love and appreciate or that we've experienced ourselves. So that it's, it's really the personal experience, be they social interactions or simply being alone and finding meaning. When I was in the Forest Service, when I first joined the Forest Service, it was always talk about goods and services. We're providing goods and services to the American public. And what I came to realize and, and preach was it's goods, services, and experiences. Because when you're on your deathbed, you're not going to, and somebody asks you, well, what, what did you get out of a national forest? They're not going to say, oh, I think about oh, 6,000 board feet, I don't know, and, uh, and about 5% of my meat would have come from national forest. No, they're going to say, I went fishing with my grandson. I w took him to the same place that my grandfather took me to fish. That's what public lands are really about. So that's also why, like that young man I was talking about from Williston, violations of place, violations of our sense of place are a deeply personal violation. People want to know why we get upset when somebody says we're going to drill on the Rocky Mountain front? <laughs> well, you know, over my dead body is basically how we respond because those of us who are attached to that place for some reason, some way, some rhyme, that's how strongly we feel about it. So, where are we going next? Let's talk about art. I, I do my speeches in kind of mind maps, and so I can kind of go wherever I want to go. And that's, sometimes that's why I get so far afield. But in this case, I'm just deciding what's going to be the most fun to talk about. Um, looking again at, at communities, at cultures, um, the, your, the, a group's profound identification with place allows them to develop a communal sense of place where people are in general agreement. Usually sense of place is considered as kind of an individual sort of approach to landscapes. But I think that it, there's also the community approach to it. And there's recognizable branding, if you will, for lack of a better word, associated with place and cultures from place. Architecture. If I show you a stucco building the kind of a pinkish red, where are you? New Jersey? Anchorage? No, most likely you're in the southwest. And, and you know, I, I could give you hundreds of examples, but, but think about it. Clothing. Clothing expresses place. I happen to really like the southwest. What do I tend to wear? When I want to feel good and feel comfortable, I start picking up silver jewelry, I put on my belt, Okay, I'm gearing up, I'm ready to go, because I feel comfortable in a particular style. Well, I'm not from the Southwest, at least in this lifetime, but I think I must have been from there another time, because I've got this real affinity for it. But likewise, the ornamentation, the foods, are very much place-based. It's a kind of brand. Art is also place-based, because place inspires art. The subject matter, the media that's used, a sand painting. You know, somebody who lives in the Arctic is not going to get into sand painting. It doesn't happen that way. Because our art reflects place. It's a, and art is such a dramatic contribution to societies and the human experience. And it's an expression of place at the same time. And, and I don't want to limit art just to the visual arts, but, but wilderness inspires poetry, prose, and inspires people to capture the images in photography. Um, 
music, it's, it's, the list goes on. And those things actually define cultures and give us cultural pride. So the wilderness is an indispensable setting for many of our cultures because on a deeper level, and or a different level, I don't want to say deeper, it symbolizes freedom, um, it inspires us uh, research, um, that intellectual curiosity I was talking about, inspires us to increase, it, increase our knowledge. And just as, as First Nation people, their use changed throughout the seasons, we have seasonal cultural phenomena that, that are really very meaningful to us. Think about hunting season in an area like this. Whoa, you know, I mean, kids even take a week off school. It's a big deal. Fishing, we know when to go fishing. We know when it's fun and when to, we have to, rafting. There's only certain times of the year that you can raft. But, man, when you can. Skiing, hiking, bird watching, tied to the seasons. And it also is a source of pride for us. When people ask, what do you do? Well, I raft. Well, where do, well, I raft where I live, you know. It's, and so we are, we, um, have this, at least that piece of memory, that this connection with the seasons as we move through time in our place. Another piece that, that is not talked about a lot is the ability to find solitude. And I'm not necessarily meaning you're all by yourself completely alone. You can have your dog with you, or you can have friends or family, but you don't have a lot of external input. Your phone is not ringing, hopefully, and you don't have distractions like, oh, I've got to be somewhere. You are basically alone by yourself or in your small group. This is psychologically very healing to the human uh, the human body, the entire body. It really reduces stress, and it builds cohesion and bonds within families and be between friends, and, and that helps us to be better, stronger, more highly functional people when we are less stressed and better connected. <coughs> and there's this other fascinating thing about, for me, wilderness is usually about trees. And what I found out, there's a really cool book that just came out recently written by Jim Robbins called The Man Who Planted Trees. And he intersperses a, a lovely story about a, a guy who's doing some phenomenal things with research about trees. Do you know that being around trees reduces your cortisol levels? Your cortisol is your stress level, literally. You can take a walk among trees and your cortisol level will be reduced not just while you're walking through the trees, but for a week afterwards. If people can see trees, people living in housing projects, if they can see trees, domestic violence is decreased by 40%. And trees also communicate through chemicals. We pick up on those chemicals. We don't, we're not even sure what they are. We're only starting to research what they are. But they help us feel better. So it's not just, woo woo, I think I really like trees. <laughs> There's something going on at a much deeper level. And of course, the exercise. And the exercise leads us to yet another benefit of wilderness. And that is that we get to challenge ourselves. We get to take our bodies out of those chairs, out from behind screens and monitors, and really start to use it the way it was intended. It's a mental and as well as a physical challenge when you're in a, challenge, when you're in a difficult um, space out in the middle of um, a lot of wild country. If you get into a situation where you're not sure quite how you're gonna get out, your mind's working, your body's working, your focus is, is pinpoint and laser-like on solving that dilemma. So you get problem-solving skills as well as as mental and physical challenges. And we tend to, to uh, we tend to be able to scale ourselves in the natural world. How big am I? What do I mean? How do I interact? What what is my passage or my presence actually contributing or attracting? We can get a sense of accomplishment and pride when we get get ourselves home, or we learn a whole lot when we can't figure out how to get ourselves home. So we have to become helpless. Um, so we gain self-knowledge, we gain greater skills and, and self-reliance. And 
it's not only us. If we're actually out there doing it, if we have the, the, the benefit of the physical body and the, and the, the time and the, the wherewithal to be out there, but even people who can get a vicarious enjoyment out of hearing about, reading about, watching films about wilderness adventures, who into thin air, oh my gosh, yeah. on the edge of our seats, it's exciting. You know? so, so even if we're not physically present, we can still get some benefit from that no particular activity. Um, beauty. Let me talk about beauty. I was a landscape architect for a portion of my career in the Forest Service, and my job was to try to help ensure that forest activities did not contrast excessively with the expected character of the environment according to the wishes of the casual observer. What that means is don't screw it up. Don't make it ugly. It should not, it sh the ac forest activities should blend with the existing environment in a way such that they do not create jarring and ugly contrast. And I use the word ugly and that's a legitimate word to use because the Monongahela Bitterroot controversy actually started because a lot of people were broken hearted because 200 acre clear cuts were so ugly. They were so painfully ugly. And they figured out that, oh, it's not good ecologically either. So that's how that, that particular piece actually moved <coughs> forward. And I got that from some of the people who were involved at the, at the very get go. That's pretty exciting. Because beauty isn't just in the eye of the beholder. Beauty, there are elements that create beauty. There's balance, there's symmetry, form, line, color, texture, variety. All these elements are, come together, and they come together beautifully in wilderness. Rarely do you see something that's wilderness. Maybe in the Arctic, at some locations, if it's covered with snow, that, that is not um, a, actually an abundance of variety, a lot of diversity in what you're looking at. And wilderness offers beauty to all for free. We've been seeing a lot of beautiful pictures up here. It, that's, it's free for you to look at those. That's, that's just great. But it's, it, there's no class distinction between who can enjoy the beauty of wilderness. The beauty also is, is part of that inspiration that I've been talking about. Um, and you know, when people say, well, you can't eat beauty, or beauty doesn't have any dollar value, au contraire, a house with a beautiful view, oh yeah, costs a lot more than a house without the beautiful view. And what do we as a society ascribe to people who have a beautiful house, or a beautiful car, or wear beautiful clothes, or, or uh, associate with beautiful people? We think they must have some kind of power, and they have some higher social standing. There's something about beauty that makes us think that it's the purview of the wealthy. And then think about the, the beauty, the economic value of beauty in communities. Where do people want to live? Where do the rich people go to live? In pretty places. Why are there so many people in Missoula and, and more people coming? How, why do we have so many people moving to Bozeman? You know, it's mountains, it's pretty, it's access to the, this beautiful environment. Gateway communities of wilderness. Hey, they've got tourism going on. They have a lot of benefits that other communities that aren't in a beautiful setting don't have. Even communities that you wouldn't think are like a gateway community, the Rocky Mountain Front. Nine million dollars a year during hunting season. So many people want to come to the front, and not because it's easy and, and you know to hunt and just you know whack something from the road. No, it's because you get to experience the place. It's a good excuse to spend a week, ten days, whatever. So this idea that that, that the beauty of natural lands and the beauty of wilderness is kind of frivolous and without value, nonsense. Priceless doesn't mean it doesn't have a value. 
So. So the wild heartbeat of nature. We have this untrammeled land, this untrammeled beauty, <coughs> readily accessible to us. And we can watch it change over time. It is not static. Dynamic, natural changes happen all the time. Even fires can have a certain beauty before and after, or during and after. And that, that feels so superior to the appearance of, of the, the human imprint that is done with disrespect and done in a way that's ugly. Wilderness provides habitat, headwaters, carbon sink, you have all this plant material producing, uh, car producing oxygen for us, sucking up carbon dioxide, and providing ecosystem services. The things that nature can do for us for free that we don't have the capability, the money, the time, the energy to do ourselves. Control erosion, produce CO2, or absorb CO2, produce oxygen. I think you, you know most of those uh, kinds of services. So it's critical that we maintain these wild lands, these, these wildernesses, so that they can continue to do the things they were intended to do because we're trashing up a lot of other lands and there's more and more people and wanting more and more things. Do you know that in the last 10 years, we produced, we as a human society, produced 25% of the total goods and services that have been produced for our entire history in 10 years. Well, what are we going to do in the next 10 years? And what are we going to do it with? So wilderness is self-sustaining. It's self-replicating. It knows how to thrive. It knows how to solve problems. You know, we, we learn in biomimicry, hey, Nature's been working at this problem for 3.8 billion years. It has things figured out, how to be the most efficient. The perils of climate change absolutely demand resilience. And we're going to be in much better shape if we have the maximum amount of productive surfaces. And in that, I include wildlands, not just croplands or, or managed forest. And so in our souls, <coughs> Of us, individuals, um, and of society. The, this power will outlast all of us if we let it. This connectivity with nature. So, what will the next 50 years look like? And what are we going to do in the next 50 years to make sure that we don't have that trend that we've seen in the last couple of decades continue until it hits the line of zero acres per decade protected? Some of the things we might want to think about doing are remembering and honoring those who got us this far. <coughs> and there are people in this room that I include in that. Thank you. And we need to protect what's existing, and we need to protect the act itself. Acts can be changed. Now, we haven't seen anybody making an all-out frontal assault on the Wilderness Act like we have on the Threatened and Endangered Species Act. But one of the things that deeply concerns me, particularly about the, the, the rhetoric and the false messaging about uh, environment versus jobs, when we move into severe economic contraction, and I say when, not if, there may be a very strong push to privatize wildlands. Under the theory the false theory that if you just give it to us corporations, we'll run it like a business, and we'll put people to work and make a lot of jobs. Guard against that religiously. 
I think we also need to recommit. Recommit to the land, recommit to ourselves, and recommit to future generations. And I mean future generations of all species, not just our own. And reflect on the priceless gifts that wilderness gives us, the, the, the gifts that are so critical to our spirit and to our body. And then we need to speak. And this gets a little harder because we need to talk to those people who are the opposite of biophilias. We need to talk to them to help debunk the myths, to make them feel more safe, more secure, more stable, because a lot of this pushback, this anti-wolf, anti-wilderness, rabidness, is because people are afraid. They feel very unstable and insecure. We have to do what we can to help them and everyone feel more stable and secure by providing positive solutions to the conundrums that we're in. We need to give voice to the, to the wild to all of its inhabitants. And we need to give a voice in the halls of policy. One of the beauties of working for, as a public land manager, is that you have a job, a responsibility, to speak for the unborn. That shouldn't be the purview of only public land managers. That should be the purview of all. And then, I say we celebrate, that we're alive to experience this, that we've been able to watch this trajectory of how we've, we've captured and recaptured our connection to, to lands and have sharing that with others and preserving that for future generations. And celebrate the beauty and just celebrate the wilderness. And with that, President Lyndon B. Johnson on signing the Wilderness Act said something pretty darn profound. <laughs> Thank you. So if you need to leave, feel free. Um, if you want to um, ask some questions, we can sure do that. And how much time do we have for that? Students, you're actually not free to leave. Oh, okay. <laughs> you have to stay till 8 30. We have a little over 10 minutes for questions. And if you could repeat the question, sure. Okay. Yes, I will do that. Questions? Comments? Thoughts? Go right ahead. something that went up around the time of the late 70s and the 80s and it's continued until today and that is a rise in overweight and obesity oh, which interesting. Uh, tends to make it more difficult to enjoy the movie. Yeah. So yeah, uh, just throw that in for future uh, mm -hmm. conversation. Yeah. Good, good thinking and that, that uh, goes back to our food sources and the amount of chemicals in our food. And, uh, Wealth inequity, or inequality, I should say, um, which is inequity. Um, yeah, good point. Other comments, observations, challenges to some of my theories? I was just going to say it seems to me that the more people are insulated in their lives, and you know, and even, I mean, children that can you know, name the golden arches, but they can't name a vegetable. Or just, I mean, I know from my own experience that being out in the wilderness is wonderful, but it still has to be a controlled experience. Like, it's supposed to be a what? A controlled experience. Okay. Like, I'm not completely comfortable with, like, you know, getting dropped off in a plane with, you know, a knife and <laughs> a box of matches and good luck and God bless. I mean, it's, it, it, because we don't have those skill sets and because how we navigate our life is different, people, I don't think, see the value of wilderness. So many people haven't even been exposed to it. When I 
remember, I, mean, I moved up here about 25 years ago, and originally, I was, we were planning on moving to Shoto. And part of the charm of Shoto was that grizzly bears came up to your back door and ate your dog food. And I was like, wow, that's so cool. Because I'd actually never seen a grizzly bear and had no idea how completely terrifying that would probably be, you know, if I saw one. You know, so. I, I, think, I think those are very good points, and I'll, I'll capture them. First, yes. this gentleman, um, in, in case it was not heard by all, he was pointing out that the, 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 uh, the um, graph all looked like it was also trending following um, the rise in obesity. And then the, uh, the comment by the, the uh, woman in the, the green scarf said that um, a couple of things. We're, we have this a very large insulation from the natural world. Some people are not even aware of wilderness. And that the, some people are, are um, not entirely comfortable um, you know, with our skill sets. We still need a lot of, of, um, of help to experience wilderness in terms of, of um, protection and, and um, security, knowing that you know, we're on the right path, we have the right tools. And um, is that kind of catch yeah. what you said? Good. I think those are a really good points. Other comments? In the back, yes. Uh, can you please uh, address how what wilderness fits into the concept of ecosystem services? Um, specifically in land planning. I know right now we're going through forest plan revisions and the uh -huh. 2012 rule um, emphasizes ecosystem services, you know, how it relates to roadless lands. Yeah, that, that's a, the question was um, how, is, how do ecosystem services in wilderness fit into um, something, a planning scheme like, like forest land management planning? Um, that's a, it's a complex question, but I'll, I'll give it a, a 30,000 foot overview. Because we have not compromised, and I caveat on that, I'll get back to it. Because we haven't compromised the ability of the natural systems in wilderness to do what they do best, which is provide ecosystem services and sustain life, their own as well as ours, um, we, we point to that and use that as kind of the hallmark. This is, this is the best function. This is the highest functioning ecosystem. And so um, when I think about ecosystem services related to wilderness, certainly the, with the abundance of, of uh, vegetation that we have in some wildernesses, we, we have the, um, the ameliorating the negative effects of climate change by absorbing more carbon not only into the living plants themselves, but also into the soil. A water is a huge one, the filtering and the cycling of water. Wilderness, in many cases, is the headwaters of, of major water systems. And if you mess with the headwaters, you have a domino effect of problems all the way down the, the chain. So protecting those headwaters by not messing around with them. I know you can put, you, there are dams in wilderness, but um, if we don't mess around with the water systems, then we're going to have higher functioning water systems or hydrologic systems on the, the lands outside of wilderness. Habitat is extremely important and it's becoming even more important as we see very significant changes in the zones that, that animals can inhabit. They're different, they're changing. And one of the scary things is that they're changing, they're not all changing simultaneously um, and in the same places. And I'm thinking of um, bees and pollinators. They, are, they tend to show up at certain times of the year, depending on particular species being in the Well, if because of global warming, the, the climate is changing and those species are blooming prior to the arrival of the pollinators, the plants don't get pollinated and the pollinators don't get food. <coughs> Likewise, switch that around. When you have some, some of the devastating um, effects of this winter in the southeast, um, in South Carolina, for instance, it's gotten to nine degrees and stayed there for a day or more multiple times. Those plants and animals are not accustomed or built to withstand those kinds of temperatures. So we're going to see a lot of um, of repercussions from the extreme temperatures. 
extreme temperatures. Simultaneously, in Australia, in the winter, what we call the winter, their summer, and in California, winter, extreme drought to the point where all, almost all livestock has to be fed for <coughs> stored grains or stored hay. There's nothing growing, and they don't have the water available to water the, the pastures to create that, that grass. So that reflects on food prices. Watch the food prices go up this summer. I'm really, really concerned about this. Two thirds of California's agricultural land is not going to get irrigated. And that is going to have a tremendous impact on food supplies, particularly those who are not adjust, adjusting and adapting to eating far more locally. Another good point for locally. Didn't mean to get off on that tangent. But it's looking at what wilderness can continue to do and provide to increase resilience. And that's kind of the bottom line because we have to be more resilient because we are getting hit with so many changes that we've never seen before that we don't know how to adapt and animals don't either. The more wildlands that we have, the more um, naturally functioning ecosystem, the more places the animals have to try to move into to find a habitat that fits the parameters they need to survive and thrive. Next term, you know, as I was looking at the curve uh, that showed how the film industry set aside in recent decades, I was wondering if you could add to one of the reasons for that the amount of uh, very wealthy corporate money influencing politics. Oh, to yes. To read that, uh, our congresspersons live in a schizophrenic world. Where they have to, uh, they have to do what the lobbyists tell them to do in order to get campaign money. But they have to make the voters think that they're doing the voters' bidding. And what we get is a Congress that's unable to move on behalf of the citizens of the United States. And I'm wondering if one of the best things that we can do for wilderness preservation is actually to to work fervently to get corporate money out of politics. <coughs> To break that connection, yeah. yeah. I'll try to summarize the point. Very good point. The, the amount of corporate control and corporate influence over politics actually drives politicians to be far more responsive to lobbyists and their funders than it does to the people that they're supposed to represent. Am I capturing that correctly? Uh, I think that's a, that's a, a very good point. And breaking that asunder. You know, Citizens United, you know, that, that particular uh, lawsuit that, that, uh, or decision by the Supreme Court that gave essentially confirmed personhood onto uh, corporations and allowed them to spend as much as they want on, on um, influencing and supporting certain um, politicians or you know, the, the politicians of their choice. My friend David Orr, fantastic environmentalist and, and a brilliant author made the comment when that happened. He said, you know, corporations and our politicians have been living together in sin for a very long time. Citizens United is just their wedding announcement. <laughs> True or words when they were spoken. I saw another one. Yes? Uh, on that note of like drought and all that, you know, Colorado is a great example. Um, I mean, sold a lot of their water. Um, and do you see something like that in the future happening with Montana with water rights, kind of those, those political issues being sorted out, actually, like you speak? Uh, do you see that eventually being more than just a political uh, debate, but also uh, environmental hazards in the future? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, he was uh, raising the point that, uh, like, Colorado and, and also what's happening here in Montana, um, this the, the availability of water, and not just for human consumption, but also to meet environmental needs, the, the, the tension that's going on now, will that be exacerbating and will the environment take it in the shorts? Quite possibly. Yeah, the, the, the water situation is, mind-boggling. 
it's, it's a very dire situation. The amount of water that cycles through the earth, they say, oh, look at all the water in the ocean. The amount of fresh water is like, it's like some minuscule percentage, like 2% of the water on, and for anybody who knows the actual figures, correct me if, if I'm wrong, but I'm trying to do this from memory. Um, about 2% of the water on the planet is actually fresh water. And then there's only a, a like a tenth, a two tenths of a percent or something that's actually readily available for human use. And the other point about water is that we are extracting fossil water. We are dewatering our aquifers so fast that there is no way that nature is going to be able to catch up and fill them back up again. And these sinkholes, people just fall into sinkholes, buildings, cars, and, and you know, it's because the aquifers are, are no longer have that water pressure in them to hold up the, the earth that's over top of them. <coughs> you know, the other point about water, who we're sharing it with, it's not just the you know people and agriculture and environment, it's energy. The, the way that we now are trying to extract fossil fuel energy, particularly gas and oil, is costing us dearly in terms of water. Two to four million gallons of water per fracked well. Per well. 200 gallons of water per barrel of tar sands oil. And that water is not just like, oh, we'll run it through a filter now and then we'll reuse it. And no, the water that's coming out of a cracked well is filled with toxins. Some toxins that, that, and chemicals that the, the frackers put into it, but also releasing some heavy metals, radiation, cadmium, lead, all kinds of things coming back up in that water. And what do we do with it? Oh, let's put a little rubber liner in a hole and then we'll just pour it in the hole and watch it. Or we drag it around, we shove it in a tank, then we take it over here, then we hide it, then we turn on the hose and flush it on the ground. Uh, it's, it is disgraceful what is happening. But you want to know a fun story, and that's probably in my... Yeah. Oh, okay, we're good. Um, fun story. Oh, the CEO of, uh, of Exxon. Oh. At Exxon, yeah. You know what? You know the story. Um, there was a water tower proposed in Barton, Texas, and, the, and they're putting up a water tower so they can store water to frack wells. Guess what? It's in the view shed of the the president or the CEO of Chevron, Exxon. Exxon, Exxon, one of the biggest frackers around. And Dick Armey, former member of Congress pimp of the oil industry. <laughs> he and his wife are leading the campaign, the charge against the company that wants to build the water tower. They don't want that water tower in their backyard. That's <laughs> going to affect their quality of life. But you know what I want to put in their backyard? I want to put a frack well in their backyard. And they can get the nosebleeds, they can get the sickness, they can get the, the inability to drink their own water because of fracking. And what is the story now? Again, like the tobacco industry. Oh, it's not a problem. It's it's a it's a prior existing condition that you have. Um, yeah, I don't know why your child is suddenly having headaches and nosebleeds every day and can't function in school anymore. It must be it must be she's watching too much television. It's your lifestyle. It's not a fracking. No. I could go on and on, but I won't because it's 8:30 and you have a tremendous audience and it's been really fun talking with you. And uh, thank you so much.